The Low Post is brought to you by Goodyear, helping you discover the road ahead. Goodyear, more driven. Ready to play ball? The Baseball Tonight podcast with the one and only Buster Olney gives you an insider's perspective Monday through Friday with the biggest names, stories, and analysis in the sport. Follow the Baseball Tonight podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Baseball is back and so are your favorite teams and players. Catch the best of the bigs all season on ESPN Plus with over 170 live Major League Baseball games featuring every star and every team in the league. Sign up now at ESPNPlus.com slash baseball. And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast live on Monday afternoon. And it is time for a depressing conversation because the Golden State Warriors... Light years ahead, golden child of the NBA, untouchable, unassailable, looked like a dynasty in the making, are 23 and 27, clinging like grim death to the last play-in spot in the Western Conference, currently tied with the Pelicans. They've lost seven of eight, including, and I shit you not, a 53-point loss without Steph Curry, it should be noted, who is dealing with a tailbone issue, which sounds horrible, frankly, to deal with a tailbone issue, but that's another story, to the Tampa-Toronto Raptors. And it's time to start asking some difficult questions about the Warriors. This is the first time since the Monte Ellis trade when Joe Lacob was booed on his home floor because Monte Ellis was so beloved. This is the first time Bob Myers, Steve Kerr, this is the first time they faced any real scrutiny. And it's fair. This is welcome to the normal NBA. So to help us dissect this, our man on the Warriors beat, the one and only Nick Friedel. How are you? My man, it is always good to be with you. And after that Hawks game on Sunday night, I had to laugh because somebody tweeted to you and I. They said, is Nick Friedel on the Warriors suck beat now? After all the years on the Bulls suck beat when I was floating around the Midwest a few years ago because the Bulls were so bad. Now it's become... Have I landed with the Warriors when they are really, really that bad? And to see it, after all my years in the league, Mr. Lowe, the one thing I know for sure is what a mediocre team looks like because I've I've watched plenty of them over time. And that is exactly what this group is and appears to be, at least in the short term, moving forward. Well, they are now, I think, worse than mediocre, at least by the numbers. They are four games under 500, a minus two per 100 possessions point differential. That is 22nd in the NBA, one spot right ahead of your old buddies, the (laughs) beloved Chicago Bulls of the Bulls suck beat, uh, who still aren't very good, uh, uh, although they're only now one game in the loss column behind the Warriors. Um, And... The play-in is official. The playoffs play-in, it's all officially in jeopardy. And we could talk about what's going on with this team and how they can't score at all when Steph Curry is off the floor. And even when he's on the floor, they only score at an average rate. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about all the ire being directed at Steve Kerr right now and whether they run not enough Steph pick and roll. Steph pick and roll is a solution to everything. Um, some of that is, is fair, I think. But let's just zoom further out and ask the only question that matters. Clay Thompson is going to come back next season after a consecutive ACL and Achilles tear. Steph and Draymond are still going to be here, presumably. Steph is eligible for a, a, an extension that is almost incalculable in value um, right now uh, or after the season. The last time we saw Steph, Draymond, and Clay Thompson playing meaningful basketball together, they damn near won the NBA championship without Kevin Durant, ran through most of the Western Conference playoffs, or at least the back half of it without Kevin Durant. We're 34 and four without KD over three seasons going into those finals against the Raptors. Let me say that again, 34 and four. Three years will have passed between then and when they will next play a playoff game together, presuming they qualify for the playoffs next year and they're all on the team. And so the only question that matters, Nick, is can this group contend with these three stars and something like the current Warriors supporting cast, plus or minus an Ubre or something, can they contend for the championship next season when Steph Curry will turn 34? No. And the sooner, You think it's that simple? I think it's that simple. And the sooner that the organization understands that, Zach, the faster that they can start to retool around Steph. But in that regard, the, the clay injury told them, and this season 
told them that they're just not good enough. That core, as great as they were, and as good as they still can be together, because I think they can be a very good team. But if the question is, can they win a title together? The answer is no. Steph is awesome. Steph's in the middle of his prime. He's still playing at an MVP level. I mean, if, if we're defining what the MVP is, Zach, <laughs> Steph absolutely is the MVP because you take him off this team and they are a complete mess. Uh, but Draymond is not the, the same player as a few years ago. Uh, he's still very good. And when Steph's on the floor, uh, he is still – one of the best defenders. I, I know all the stuff. People are all over him about the you're the best defender of all time. That's a separate conversation. But with Steph, he's still a really good defender. He's still a really good playmaker for the rest of the group. But he's giving them basically nothing offensively. And then I don't know how anybody can count on Clay, knowing that he's coming off these two awful injuries. So with all that in mind, if you're really being honest, and the Warriors have to be Bob Myers, Joe Lacob, Steve Kerr, everybody going into this summer, the answer to the question is no. So then the follow-up question is, well, what do you do to try and turn it around? And you and I can get into every layer that there is, but it seems to me that the only real question as to bringing in another star is, would you trade James Wiseman, the Minnesota pick, uh, Andrew Wiggins and a couple other picks potentially for Bradley Beal if he comes out onto the market because Beal would be great with Steph. Uh, they'd be a hell of a lot of fun to watch. But even then, Zach, even then with Beal, Clay, Draymond, and Steph in that scenario, that is a really, really good team. But I don't believe they can win a title either. So I think that the Warriors are in deep trouble as far as title contention goes again because I just don't think no matter how you add up the pieces that it's enough to get them back to where they're used to be now if they made a trade like that I would disagree with you I would put them right in the first tier now Beal is Beal the perfect fit not really with he's a third guard right you're committing to playing three guards altogether. but just as a talent play the talent is undeniable um I think, you know, look, I, I've seen those guys, those three guys do so many special things for the last seven years that I am hesitant to just write them off as contenders. Um, but I think given how much time has passed and given that Draymond has clearly declined to to be a complete non-threat as a scorer, um, and that's that's the most important thing that's happened to their team other than Clay's injuries and, and Durant leaving is, is, is on the court. Draymond Green's decline is you could count on him to hit a couple of floaters, roll in for a layup, get to the line five or six times a game. He had one year where he shot in the high 30s from three that proved to be a huge outlier. It was a 73 win season, but he was low 30s a couple of like he wasn't just this. Um, I, I think you'd have to lean toward the answer being probably no. I mean, you'd have to see what's going to happen with the Clippers and the Lakers and other things like other things will happen. But I, I think if you're taking a good, honest look in the mirror, you have to conclude that the answer is probably not quite good enough to win it all next year and proceed accordingly. And and to your point, I think that's a, that's that's the conversation you have to have is they have Wiseman. They have this pick from Minnesota that I believe they have a 60 percent chance of getting because it's top three protected and then unprotected the following year. What can you get? And you can get into a lot of conversations with that player and that pick. But the last month of the James Wiseman experience has not been good. Zach, he looks completely lost on the floor. And any conversation about the Warriors' present and future centers around James Wiseman. And I have gotten into this argument with fans, with, <laughs> with people in the organization over the last month or so. And the argument always is, He's 19, and now a week ago he turned 20. So it's he's 20. Of course he was going to struggle. Of course there were going to be issues. But he's worse right now than he was to start the year. It's it, it's unquestionable. It's he's 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 lost right now. Com he, he, and you can see that he has no confidence. You can see it completely. And if you're trying to figure out where the Warriors go from here, what you're really trying to figure out is a year later. What do you think James Wiseman can be? And the problem for the Warriors, Zach, is it's not that they didn't know that Wiseman was going to struggle. They knew, and they knew that there were going to be growing pains. 
The issue is that they thought he would be able to kind of hit the ground running. And that hasn't happened. And once that didn't happen, you started to go, oh, man. So it's probably not going to be two years till he can uh, kind of finds his stride. And maybe he can help at the end of Steph's prime and be that bridge that they need between one era to another. Let's just call it what it is. He, he hasn't been good at all. And if you if there is one knock that I think is fair for – Steve Kerr and the coaching staff and and Warriors fans will say there's <laughs> there's lots of different ways to go here, but they I don't think they realize just how fragile Wiseman was going to be as far as development uh, physically and mentally. And once he got pulled out of that starting lineup, his confidence really got shaky, uh, and then he got hurt, and then he missed those COVID tests. Uh, during the all-star break and he missed the practice going into the first game. And there were all these different issues, but his confidence that started off pretty strong early has completely disappeared. And to build that back up in, in the middle of a season is really tough. And you just have to hope if you're, if you're the front office that with a summer league and with a full training camp and not having to deal with all the COVID protocols that he can take a much bigger step, but, the early returns simply aren't good. He has not been what they thought he was going to be, even though they knew he was going to struggle. And look, people think drafting is easy, whether it's at the top or the bottom of the first round. It's not, I mean, we had we had like four teams voluntarily, or th- several teams voluntarily didn't take Luka Doncic. I mean, like, th- like it, it's hard. People make mistakes. But lo- the way LaMelo played in Charlotte this year, probably still the favorite for the rookie of the year, I think throws the Wiseman pick into even a brighter spotlight. And look, you see glimpses. He is 20 and you see glimpses. Um, but for the last month when he's been in the game on the, you know, available to play, the only glimpses really have been when he catches all oops. And he hasn't really been that dynamic doing that, frankly. And we can talk about why that is, but you know, defensively he's got, he moves his feet. He slides. Okay. You see moments of, there are even moments where I'm like, I wonder if he could be a switching five. He sometimes looks kind of comfortable switching, but then there are other moments where he jumps. He ju- he does the the cardinal sin for big men when you jump late to block a shot and you jump so late that by the time you've jumped, you know, uh oh, I'm late. And then not only have you not affected the shot, you can't box out for a rebound. So you've just you've you've missed everything. You've missed the mark on both on both counts. He does that a lot, but and and, and again, he's he's. 20 and he's learning the NBA after not playing college. Basically, he also started the season five of six from three. He's seven of 30 since then. So this this the three pointer that looked like it was going to be exciting has has completely disappeared. But, you know, it's way too early to call him a bus. In fact, I still think he'd have pretty, pretty healthy trade value around the league. It's just taking a center at number two. When you have Steph Curry at age 32, 33. Now you, you got to nail that pick. And right now it the early returns, as you said, and the early returns matter because yep. they want to win the championship yep. in the next couple of years. They want to try to. Um, so you can say it's early, but it's late for Steph. You know, it's late for Clay. It's late for Draymond. And he doesn't look ready. And he and he doesn't he doesn't look ready even to be like Tyson Chandler on offense. And and we can talk about how the ecosystem has sort of worked against him in that way, but the early returns just aren't good. Zach, you can't have it both ways. And I think that's the issue that the Warriors are dealing with because you can't go oh, man, this kid can really help us, and and we believe that he can uh, really uh, help Steph over time, even though we know that he's going to have his problems. And once he's struggling, uh, turn around and go, oh, he's 19. Oh, he's 20. Uh, This is what the Warriors understood all along, and this is where uh, I I see red flags as far as Wiseman's first season because – the Warriors have gone out of their way. I mean, you've got Juan Toscano Anderson and, and Damian Lee pushing back on a, a, a tweet by uh, my buddy Anthony Slater about how Wiseman needs to, to do better as a 20 year old and needs to show uh, incremental growth. And you're going, why are they defending him like this? And the well, answer, they're teammates. But the answer, see, I think the problem is, though, the answer here is it goes deeper than that. And they, absolutely, that's understood as a teammate. But I think that they know how much he's struggling. They know how much he's seen 
and how many people are all over him and they're trying to defend him more now. And that is, that, that's something that every young player has got to deal with and respond to. And I can't tell you how many times, Zach, I've been sitting, I've gone to every single Warriors game at Chase Center. Uh, Wiseman makes a mistake instantly, shoulders slumped, head down, walk slowly to the bench. Teammates try to walk over and pick him up and say, oh, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. But once he makes that first mistake, it's like a snowball. Then the second and third ones come. And then you go, oh, no. So uh, that's the thing that would be very concerning is that what they're teaching him on the practice floor is not translating to games right now. Not to say that it can't happen. And like you said, nobody is saying he's a bust. But the improvements that you want to see from a young player aren't there on top of the fact I think he's really struggling to criticism. I think one of the most honest things Draymond said all year was a few weeks ago, he's like, let's be real. This is the first time this kid's ever struggled on a basketball floor in his life. And when you go through those first struggles and you don't bounce back, uh, that's a serious, serious issue. And again, uh, there's a lot of blame to go around in this Warriors situation. But Steve Kerr wanted to win, and he wanted to win now. And so did Steph and Draymond, et cetera. But the, the Warriors, in hindsight, would have been better served saying James Wiseman is going to start and he's going to play at least 20 to 25 minutes every night and we are going to live through the mistakes, whatever they may be. And early on, after they saw that he was struggling and that he wasn't putting it all together, he was going with Kevon Looney more. Then he was starting Kevon Looney. Uh, then Wiseman got hurt. Now he, he's not sure exactly what seems to be going on. And all of those stops and starts and all of the lack of uh, progression that we've seen have all added up to uh, a really disappointing first year for uh, the young center. Steve Kerr just loves Kevon Looney. There's loves just, he's just, he's a little, he's like the security blanket. I feel like if Steve Kerr got to pick the team USA roster, Kevon Looney would make it as like a 13th man. Just like we got to get Kevon Looney. He'd be like the Mason Plumley of Steve Kerr's team USA roster. It's like, and that's uh, not, Kevon like, Looney's like, he feel he has a good feel for the game. He's a solid player. I just, he's also, if you ask me to rank, like who are the 10 most boring players in the NBA? Like who, when they're on the floor, you like, I'm now 10% more bored by this game. He would be on the list. He might be number one. He might be the most boring player. <laughs> in the NBA no he's a good player I just I don't no one is like oh sweet come on come on Looney's in the game here comes a, a layup where he doesn't jump at all and it may go from one side of the rim to the other without touching the rim Goodyear knows when the season starts heating up so do the possibilities playoff hopefuls are beginning to emerge and contenders are solidifying their position from here on out every game is a chance to create momentum to make the right pass the right move to hit the perfect shot it takes momentum to build up to the moment but it takes everything to capture it. Goodyear, more driven. Let's talk about some of the names you just mentioned. Damian Lee, Juan Toscano Anderson. Solid players. Those are real NBA players. Like Damian Lee's been really good for them. Bang for the buck. I love Juan Toscano Anderson. Okay? I think he's a real NBA player. I'm glad they gave him a shot. They are just too dependent on guys that are 10th men like their bench is just is just a bunch of 10th men and and they're over relying on them and that's where that's where you, the scrutiny will start to be directed at the front office right and so you'll hear things like well um you know do, do people remember Nemanja Nedovic taken with the 30th pick <laughs> Jordan Bell didn't work out the Damians Jones and, Jones and James didn't work out they they bought the Pat McCall pick Jacob Evans the smiley each thing is going to follow them around for everywhere oh. forever if he oh. doesn't pin, turn into anything but you, and uh-huh. then you'll hear then you'll hear all about the names they had right under their noses George Niang Justin Holiday Seth Curry Kendrick Nunn oh. and you'll want to say well look at all these missed opportunities and then you'll remember Really hard, and I we talked about this with, with, about Gar Packs. Yeah, everyone got so fed up with Gar Packs, hated Gar Packs. Just, just they would list all the draft misses, and then like dot dot dot. But you know they did get Jimmy Butler at twenty nine or twenty eight or whatever. There's no, there's a thirty. There's, there's no but but but. You got Jimmy Butler at the end of the first round. That's like worth ten hits on the sixteenth pick. Yeah, and th- to, to, this is the front office. They got Draymond Green in the second round. Azili was a good pick. Jordan Poole looks like he's going to be okay at number 28 or whatever he was. Pascal's a good pick. Like they've and and you know what this really is when you dissect all of these fringe names? This is the real NBA. This is a normal 
front office. This is a normal, um, this is this is normal life. You hit some, you miss some. This is what happens to great teams. They get old, they draft 30th every year, so they don't find anyone that can really help their team, and they get bad. Now the Warriors aren't bad yet, and they got a long way to travel to get bad, but this is the cycle that great teams almost nine times out of ten travel. And so whenever there's, oh, Steve Kerr did this wrong and Bob Myers did this wrong, the ringer just did a, a whole draft analysis of every GM value compared to expected value for every pick since 2010. The Warriors finished fifth, largely on the backs of the Draymond Green pick. So this is just life. It's what the Spurs did staying that good for that long is like impossible. It, do, it doesn't happen. And so the Warriors are living the back end of a dynasty right now, and they're going to fight like hell to keep it going. But this is just, you know, when you want to scrutinize, why does their bench stink? You know, who are all these people? Where did they get them? Why don't they have better players? Well, they have three guys making over $110 million a year, no cap room, no exceptions, no anything, and they pick 30th every year. This is what happens. I feel like we're staying in a family feud, and I need to just sit there and clap for a good answer, good answer, and actually mean it. <laughs> who's your Who's your best family feud host? I grew up with Ray Combs. Nick, I knew that there was a reason why we got along. There you go. I will I will fight I thought he anyone, was awesome. Anyone. Ray Combs is the number one yeah. best family feud host. Do you know what he would do? Like once or twice a year. I used to love I used to watch Family Feud like every every time it was on, I would yeah. watch it. Yeah. Once or twice a year, the first person in fast money. Would, would win, would get 200. And then he would say, okay, we're going to play a trick on the next person and ask them like five impossible questions. And like by the fourth one, the person would start getting onto it. And like, this seems, this seems like Ray Combs. Anyway, we're <laughs> totally off the rails. Ray Combs, a legend. I don't even know what the hell we were talking about. No, I got you. I got you because we were talking about the, the real life of the NBA. And this how, is real. You could go through every team and be like, well, how did they let George Yang go? How did every team, every team has this conversation. Zach, I was looking at the box score last night. I'm going, man, how did they get this bad this quickly? How did it, how did it get to this point? This is the bench that Steve Kerr played against the Hawks on Sunday night. Kent Bazemore, Jordan Good player, Poole, solid player. Kent Bazemore this year has not been very he's, good. He's been riding the struggle bus, but like he's making the minimum. He's a, well, he's, exactly. Uh, like for for what and this, but this speaks to your point. For what you're paying these guys, and for them being like the tenth man on a regular roster. Okay, if you're viewing it through that prism, but this is the point. This bench last night that played Bazemore, Pool, Juan Toscano, Anderson for a few minutes in the fourth, who, who picked up three quick quick fouls. Damian Lee and Kevon Looney. And Pascal is hurt. He's got a hip injury, uh, but he was out of the rotation over the last week. But that's your bench. I mean, people get so focused on Steph and Draymond and uh, what's going on, what's going to happen with Oubre and Wiggins. Still looks like Andrew Wiggins. What defined that Warriors group for so many years? It was Andre Godala and Sean Livingston and David West and Bogut and all these guys coming off the bench. Barbosa would come in and Barbosa. have a game. You knew what you had, and you knew when they came in, they were pro players who would take care of business. When Steve Kerr looks at this bench right now, I'm sure he just kind of gets incredibly nervous every time because you pull stuff off the floor. We know what happens. But even now, look at that list. Think about that list. There's There is nobody – and I know that Poole has been a little bit better this season after coming back from the G League bubble. But, Zach, I'd argue that there is nobody, nobody I'd want long-term out of that group. And and that goes with with Looney being a favorite of Kerr like Taj Gibson is for Tibbs. Like, it, it, he's in that group. But there's no person that I would build forward with. I, I still have a lot of doubts uh, for everybody on that list. So, with that in mind, it's just another reminder of how far away they are to me because we can talk about the issues at the top of the roster and they are large once you start uh, going past Steph. But the issues at the back of the roster are just as bad and they've got a bunch of 10th and 11th men who are getting 
bigger minutes and have been all season. And it's a reason why they are where they are in the standings. Well, and again, Clay Thompson is injured. Okay. Like yeah. it's like Ben Simmons missing the playoffs last year for the six years. You, you shouldn't bury that. We can't bury that. The solution to, well, our team falls apart when one star is off the floor. You can play that guy more. Newsflash, Steve Kerr's thought of that idea. They're not doing it. And if they're not doing it, see, it's not like Steve Kerr. They're in a meeting and someone's like, hey, what if we played Steph 39 minutes again? Whoa, you can do that? Let's just do that. They, like, they've talked about it. They're, they just, are, it's not something they're going to be doing. Wait, wait, wait. Before we leave that point, I want to make this too, because uh, it's another fair criticism of, of Kerr this season. Steve has, has been so good for so long in in dealing with the media, and he's so open to all these different interview requests, and, and that's why he gets the benefit of the doubt, I think, largely throughout the league. But, Zach, again, for all the good that Steve has done in that realm, and he's the best manager coach I've ever dealt with as far as getting the narrative he wants out for his team on a daily basis, if he could pull back one quote all year, it was the, we're not going to chase wins. And it was in reference and in context to Steph playing a few more minutes. I think they were in San Antonio a couple months ago. And it, it, Steph could have been out there and he could have gone from 34, 35 minutes to 38 or 39. He could have played most of the fourth quarter. Maybe uh, they would have won that game. But Steve said, we're not, we're not out here chasing wins because we're playing – uh, for something deeper than that with Steph. We want him to be healthy long-term. That quote set a bad, bad tone, not only for the fan base, but I think uh, across the league, people are like, well, what are, what are the Warriors doing? And everybody has missteps. Everybody has quotes that they'd like to pull back. But as far as Steve Kerr goes this year, the chasing wins quote has hung around him. And it's why when you bring up Steph's playing time or – uh, his inability to come back a little earlier at certain spots throughout the year, it's one thing that uh, that fans always point to, and it's one thing that anybody who's followed this team kind of falls back on and goes, ah, I bet he wish he, he could have had that one back. The other solution other than just playing Steph more would be to stagger your best players so that one is only on the one is always on the floor. Obviously, their second best player is not present. That's Clay. He's recovering from an injury. We all miss Clay. Clay is one of my favorite players in the league. Uh, and Draymond Green is not that kind of player. They've clearly decided we're just tethering Steph and Draymond together for as long as possible. You'll get some Steph only minutes at the end of the first quarter every game, and maybe at the end of the third quarter. But Draymond is not w without another supernova talent next to him. He's no longer the kind of like he would help, I guess, a little bit. He would help the Damian Lees get open and Jordan Poole's going to be to help. But that's not. An easy solution. I do wonder if next year they could try, if this is essentially the team, they could try playing Clay and Draymond together when Steph sits to try and avoid this issue. But this just brings us to the, let's circle all the way back to Wiseman. Um, I, I do think the motion offense the Warriors run has been difficult for Wiseman and his life would be easier if it was just a sea of Steph Wiseman pick and rolls, just screen, dive, lob, blah, blah, blah. Um, so here are the numbers because everyone's always up in arms about the pick and roll. Steph is running 33 pick and rolls per 100 possessions this year, according to Second Spectrum. In 2016, it was 33. In 2017, it was 33. In 2020, it was 32. In 2018, it was 37. One year, the last uh, 2014, which I believe is the last Mark Jackson year, it was 47. Um, so his pick and roll volume, this is just what it is. It's, it's, been, it's the same as it's always been under Kerr. Um, and the problem, the issue is if you run Steph Wiseman pick and roll, have you seen the way teams are guarding Draymond? They're not guarding him at all. There's a third guy right in the lane clogging everything up. Now, can they still be successful at it? Absolutely. Steph got a layup just last night against, who did they, I don't even know, Atlanta, uh, when they put Draymond kind of along the baseline, not quite all the way in the corner. He slithered through and got a layup on a Curry Wiseman pick and roll. The Curry Green pick and roll is still really effective. Like, dump the ball to Draymond, lob to Wiseman. They got an Ubre dunk out of that action last night. And all of that stuff will be more effective next season, despite Draymond's, you know, scoring limitations with Clay and with maybe one other better shooter if they can find one. But, but better talent lifts everything up, and all that stuff 
work better. And Draymond knows what to do when no one's guarding him. Just call for a handoff. Because if if I hit my guy with a handoff, no one's waiting on the other side. Well, if that's Kelly Oubre, the defense doesn't care. If it's Clay Thompson, the defense really, really cares. And a lot of stuff opens up. So, look, we've all lionized how the Warriors, not we, fans, have loved how the Warriors play. Right? They're the anti-Harden. They're the anti-Houston. What a breath of fresh air that this team plays offense this way. And they no longer have as many high IQ guys. You mentioned all the brain drain that's happened with Iguodala and Livingston and all that. And now they're more desperate for offense. I do think there is merit to the criticism that Steve should lean a little more in the direction of if Steph is willing to do it, and I bet he is, of just put the ball in our best guy's hands and not have him run around all the time, not have any possessions, minimize them. When Andrew Wiggins shoots a long two out of a pink roll, though, he's been fine this year. When Kelly Oubre does something, let's minimize, let's just let's just go whole hog, hand the offense over to Steph. I do think there is a happy medium between the current offense and the offense that some of the really, really strident Kerr critics want to see and won't see. I think there is a happy medium in, in there somewhere that they should and could get to. It ties back into exactly what we've been saying. They don't trust Wiseman really at all out there on the floor yet because they know he doesn't know where to be. He's not comfortable. Zach, his hands are really bad. He, he, he hasn't been able to catch really well. Uh, so that's a huge part of it. And it, it ties back into Dream On being a non-threat. I mean, teams just I, – I can't tell you how many times teams have sagged off Draymond to a point where they are giving him, you know, 10, 15 feet all the time. They are daring him to put up any kind of shot because, one, they know that he doesn't have the consistent confidence to do it, and, two, all he's doing is looking to make that extra pass, usually to Steph, and he's trying to force it in most of the time, and sometimes he gets burned, although I will say Draymond is the only one out of this group who actually seems to be looking for Wiseman on a regular basis. And by the way, is still an all world defender. I mean, it's like, forget the assist. The assist numbers are amazing. The assist numbers are even a little problematic for me because it's indicative of his complete lack of interest in ever shooting basically. Um, But his defense remains as essentially as it was in, in his prime. He's been awesome on that end. The issue though is, and, and this is a, a broader issue on the roster. Let's look at it this way. With Steph Curry, you know what you're getting every night. One of the game's greats. Uh, he could carry that team when he wants to, but you know what's going to come. With Draymond every night, you know you're going to get your defense, and you know he's going to play make for everybody. But after that, it's kind of hit or miss. It's like half on, half off. You can go through the numbers, and there are times when Draymond just does not look engaged out there on the floor, and it's especially telling when Steph's not out there. Well, it's but, also not great that he just came out and said, I don't really care about the play-in I, tournament. Well, I got was, news for you, man. Like, you ain't got nothing else to care about right now because you're not playing for anything else. That's what you're playing for. The, and it's funny how everything's kind of coming back around because it's an acknowledgement of reality for the Warriors that I don't know if they've been ready to accept. Because – when you're talking about quotes that you can pull back on the air and Steve saying, ah, we don't want to chase wins. Draymond saying, I'm not motivated. I'm not motivated by the play in game when it appears every day. Like that's exactly the only thing that they're going to have left to sneak their way into the postseason. I mean, you know this, but Steph is beloved in that locker room. All these young guys, they can't believe that they're playing with Steph Curry. I, I can't tell you how many times the last couple of years all these young guys have said it's unbelievable because you watch him and he's hitting shots from all over and you're like, I can't believe he's my teammate. But Draymond, his journey has been more tangible for the group. He is he is beloved uh, internally. And so for Draymond to say that, you can't tell me that the, these young guys weren't sitting there going, oh, well, if Draymond's not that into it, what, what do we need to be that into it for? So that, that I understood what Draymond was saying. I think Kerr did too, but it would, did not set the message that's needed for this team this year with where they're at. But uh, getting back quickly to the roster issue, you know what you're getting from Steph. You know, at, at least most of the time, you're, what you're getting from Draymond uh, when Steph's out there. 
Andrew Wiggins, Zach, uh, a year and a half later with the Warriors, I think defensively he's a little more consistent. But guess he's what? He's been solid. solid. He, he looks a lot like Andrew Wiggins uh, when you look at the box score. He's going to get you 18. Uh, he's he's going to play – Pretty solid perimeter defense, but he is who he is at this point in his career. And by the way, we should say, speaking of Andrew Wiggins, if we're going to sit here and dissect front office moves that did or didn't happen, by hook or by crook, they got they they the Durant leaving turned into Giangelo Russell, turned into Andrew Wiggins, and the most valuable extra draft pick in the league right now. So yeah, were they kind of lucky that Minnesota just had to have D'Angelo Russell? Just had to have him. Can't have anyone else. That's the guy we got to have. Yeah, but, you know, you, you make your own luck. Um, the, what I, the, the larger point I was trying to make is Steph pick and roll, Steph pick and roll, Steph pick and roll is a little bit more complicated because of the presence of Draymond Green. Draymond is essentially an extinct species in the NBA. He's a perimeter big who can't or won't shoot. That player doesn't exist anymore. And he exists in Golden State only because of how good he is defensively and what a good playmaker he is. And the playmaking makes up for a lot of the spacing issues he brings if they have the kind of talent they had around him, even pre-KD. Like, what right. play would just make a huge difference in that regard. So it's just, but it is still their best option. Like, Steph drew two three-shot fouls last night. They got all these other good looks. It's still probably their best option. They should probably do more of it. And let's end with the bigger question. Let's say they, you know, make the play in, miss the play in, whatever. Don't do anything, really. Make any real noise. I do think if you ask me what do I think they're going to do, I think they will get to the end of the season. They have to have that tough conversation with themselves. And I think they, if you had to ask me to predict, I think they come to the conclusion of we have to try to win while Steph is here. He's going to be a lifer. We want him to, we want him to be a lifer. Not he's going to be, we want him to be a lifer. Cause I don't know what's going to happen in the NBA anymore. Um, we want him to be our Dirk. And so we owe it to him and Draymond and Clay to try to win. And if that's the conclusion you come to, I, I think they would explore what they can get for Wiseman and the Minnesota pick and whatever else. And maybe Beal's the only thing that becomes worthy of it. If, if Washington even crosses the Rubicon with, with Beal, which they haven't. And if not that, then I think you just wait, wait, wait for the next the next one to try and fall, but they're, I, I would expect them to, if this is what their team is at the end of the year, I, maybe you disagree with me, but I would expect them to have those kind of conversations with, with themselves and with other front offices. I think anything is possible. And let's clear this up too, because this seems to be gaining more noise with Steph. And, and Brian mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but uh, is, is LeBron recruiting Steph? Would Steph actually leave? In my time dealing with him on a regular basis sec he's always been pretty honest with with what he wants and what he wants to do in his career and he's only ever talked about staying with the warriors for the long haul uh, he wants to wear one jersey he said it over and over and over again so i don't buy even if they completely spin out here and they don't make the play in game that all of a sudden uh, Steph is going to be like, I'm out of here, or consider that idea. I think Steph Curry, at least for the next few years, he'll sign the extension this summer, and he'll try to, to figure it out on the fly, what we're discussing. But this is, this is the point that we've been discussing throughout uh, the, 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 the pod here. When you look at the roster, what other option is there, aside from Wiseman and that Minnesota pick? Because Draymond at this point in his career is who he is. Wiggins is who he is. If you keep Oubre, Oubre is so up and down. And I'm not even sure, having watched him now all this year, if he really fits with this group. Clay will help. But Clay called his shot a few weeks ago said, hey, I'm not coming back playing 40 minutes, guarding the best guy, dropping 25 every night. It's going to take time. So aside from turning Wiseman in that pick into whether it's Beal or somebody else. That's the problem when, when the Warriors front office looks at all its options. They are capped to the max. I mean, this is what happens. The bill came due for all the success they had over the last few years because nobody was faulting them for redoing the Clay deal and giving him max money. That, that second injury was awful, and the timing was terrible. Nobody's going to fault them for giving Steph mega max money. 
Wiggins, it's like you said with D'Angelo Russell. Like they had to get off that money somewhere, so that turned into Wiggins and this Minnesota pick. But that contract is awful. You know what they should do? They should just trade Wiseman and the Minnesota pick back to Minnesota for Carl Anthony Towns. That's the trade. Now, I'm half being facetious, but if you don't think the Warriors' brain trust is sitting there rooting against the team of every in their prime star in the NBA, rooting for every, every one, one of those teams to fail from Milwaukee to Minnesota to you name it. I mean, that's the, the, because they will ultimately need someone to say to them, I want to go there. Trade me there. They have the stuff. Trade me there. And that's a two way street. That's, the players, the Warriors have to want that player. The player and his team have to be at a point of no return. Who knows if that will happen? But man, it has been a rough year for the Warriors. And, the, and I, I, before we say goodbye, Nick, I have to tell you, no team should want you in their market, man. <laughs> we, 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 like that, that's that's the basic reality here. If I'm if, if I'm any other team, like if we're starting, like the Nuggets are getting hot, like hey, maybe we should send Nick to Denver. Tim Connolly should get on the phone. With the big bosses at ESPN, but do not send Friedel here. <laughs> All right, Nick. Thank you, man. Oh, buddy. It's always good to be with you. All right. For a nice contrast with the cratering Warriors, it's time to talk about the Denver Nuggets, who are undefeated since acquiring Aaron Gordon. And I'm going to read a stat that will blow your mind, but not my guest's mind, because he knows the stat already. And my guest, of course, is Adam Morris of the DNVR Sports Umbrella. There are maybe 20 people alive who know the Nuggets better than Adam or as well as Adam, and they all play or work for the Nuggets. Adam, how are you? I'm doing good. And I'm really excited to talk about this team. It, it is a perfect time, as I think it's the most interesting they've been in the last six, seven years. And they've been a pretty interesting team. So th this will be fun. Um, can you guess the stat that I'm going to read? It could be the the net rating of the starting five. It could be. I'm not even going net rating because it's it's more impressive the other way. The new starting five with Aaron Gordon, so that's Murray, Barton, Gordon, Porter, Jokic, has played 90 minutes. Mm. They are plus 61 in 90 minutes. That is like the Globetrotters aren't plus 61 in 90 minutes, even if they decided right. to try and not let the generals get a taste of it, you know? Um, they are absolutely ridiculous. And I think 538 has them either, I think 530, let me see, 538 has them with a 13% chance to win the championship, which is fourth behind the Jazz, the Clippers, and the Nets. Basketball reference has a much lower than about 5%. I think... 10 to 13% is about right. I think this the Denver Nuggets yeah. are a championship contender right now. They are they are for real and I think the Gordon addition, look, this is early statistical noise, but I was optimistic about his fit. It's been smoother and better than I thought it would be. What has stuck out to you about why that lineup is working so well? Oh, there's so much to it. And and first to kind of get into that stat, sometimes when you have a small four-game sample size with a five-man lineup, you, they they outscored a team by 25 points in one game and then just marginally here and there. But, you know, they play about four stints per game, first quarter, second quarter, third, fourth. And I think all but maybe one or two of those stints have been major positives, you know, six, eight point gains. So it's a pretty consistent thing. But from a basketball perspective, what stands out is you now have the ability to play what I call Jokic ball, where the ball is just going from one action to the next. You don't have to you know, reset. Oh, we don't want to run a dribble handoff with Paul Millsap. So we have to kind of shuffle the deck. You cut through and somebody comes around. You just can go from one action to the next seamlessly. Will Barton, Aaron Gordon, Michael Porter, Jamal Murray, whoever gets into that dribble handoff action, you know, feels comfortable doing it and the team can read and play off of them. And then on the defensive end, they've suddenly become athletic. And this has been a thing about the Nuggets in the Jokic era, Jokic Murray era, is they haven't really had a, an athletic team, but Michael Porter now being a bigger piece, and then Aaron Gordon, defensively, they just look large, and they look smooth and, and on a string defensively and able to sort of play aggressively on that end. So both ends of the court clicking and, and so many cool things happening with them. Yeah, the um, Gordon, when I sat and thought about the day of the trade, okay, they've essentially replaced Jeremy Grant with yeah. Aaron Gordon, and they paid a real price to do that. Rather than re-signing Jeremy Grant, they traded right. R.J. Hampton, a good young player, and a pick. 
And Gary Harris. Should not right. to be sneezed at, frankly, although he's in year four of a shooting slump. So it's not even a slump right. anymore. It's just a career right. arc. And and I I sat there that day thinking, okay, how are those players different? And I came away, and, and obviously this trade had been rumored for quite some time, so I had already been thinking about right. it. Right. I think Aaron Gordon is is going to be a better fit than Jeremy Grant. It, it, Jeremy Grant's a better scorer with the ball. He's right. proven that in Detroit. The Nuggets don't need that. Aaron Gordon's a better passer, and he's just faster. Like the speed and athleticism that you talked about, they need a team of quick movers and decision yeah. makers around Jokic. And Jeremy Grant is kind of laborious in, in a way that might surprise you when you watch him with the ball. Gordon's cutting. I mean, how many easy looks are they getting with him just setting a back screen for Jamal Murray? It's just like every time he does it, or I'm sorry, Jamal Murray's setting a back screen for him. It's a dunk for Gordon. It's a three for Murray. It's just it, it, the speed is completely different. And that that action you're talking about with Murray setting the back screen and then kind of a screen the screener, then he comes off for a pick and roll with Jokic. That is the basis of of so many of their plays. Maybe above half of their plays, it just begins with a Murray back screen on either Port or Gordon. And teams can't switch it. And I think that's the thing with Denver that feels sustainable is, you know, everybody wants to be able to switch as much as possible, but nobody wants to put their point guard on 6'10", Michael Porter, or really strong and physical Aaron Gordon. And that physicality is one difference, I think, between Jeremy and Aaron Gordon is Jeremy was more of a finesse player. As athletic as he was, he really was getting posters or going hard at rebounds or this or that. Aaron Gordon seems to really embrace it. So if you do switch, as they did last night, and Aaron Gordon gets caught on – or I'm sorry, R.J. Hampton gets caught on Aaron Gordon, that becomes an easy feed over the top or po- or just power post. The only entry. scenario where I want Aaron Gordon posting up or isolating is when he has like a, a huge size advantage. Other than that, I don't want any part of it. What I like about it, though, and this has been one of the revelations, I think, for Aaron Gordon is he's not taking those. I mean, he's taking if you switch and you get the easy just sort of duck in, he'll take it. But he hasn't really looked to put the ball in the court and and try to make a one on one uh, move or anything like that. I put a stat out earlier. This is obviously small sample size things. He's up up to, I think, 55, 60 shots total. But 70 over 77 percent of those shots have been assisted. Two point shots have been assisted, which is more than double what his rate was for his career. So he's really cut out any type of self-creation. He's almost being too, he, you can tell he's being unself. He's trying to be yeah. unselfish. Like he's throwing some passes where I'm like, man, that's, I don't even think you needed to pass that one. You could have right. taken that shot. Um, and let, I mean, zooming even further we, we, and their bench, we can talk about their bench and whether they'll stagger Murray and Jokic when, when it really matters, but they're pretty deep. I mean, they're playing this bench mob last night of against Orlando of mm. Campazzo, uh, Morris, Dozier, Jamichael Green, who's been great for them, and JaVale McGee making his long-awaited right. uh, Denver re-debut. And it's like, well, they don't even have Paul Millsap out there in that group. They can play Millsap and Green together at the four and the five uh, if they decide to stagger Murray. And weirdly, the the Murray only and Jokic, well, Murray and Jokic separate have not worked at all this year. I think that's right. probably a fluke. It, the, the, if they stagger Murray, like, does Campazzo not play? Is Campazzo, is Campazzo not playing a crime against basketball? Yes, it is. We all need more <laughs> Campazzo in our lives. Um, they're just deep and they're loaded. And above and beyond all else, you just mentioned the pain of switching. Yeah. And I think that's what Murray and Jokic proved in the playoffs last season. They have an answer for everything. Right. Whatever defense you want to throw at them, because Jokic can post up and Murray can take bigger guys off the dribble, right. there yeah. is no answer that you can throw at them that it, that they don't have a counter for. They know every trick. They know every scheme. They know how to counter it. And the bigger story, Jokic has obviously gotten a ton of attention. He's the MVP front runner right. right now. I think he is the MVP. Murray, over the last six weeks, has been, if not the player he was in the playoffs, which was like right. Michael Jordan crossed with Batman, right. Right. Um, a legitimate star player. He has made the leap to consistent, efficient, scoring, confident playmaking – and their two best players are reaching, not reaching their apex, because we don't know where their apex is, they're so young, right, but right. are reaching a level that is going to be pretty close to their apex at the same time. And that is a very, very powerful thing. 
I think with Murray, it's not just the shot making, which, you know, the three point shot, it, every, everybody knows about that. His mid range game is very good. And his ability to finish at the rim and get to the rim and be creative around the rim is very, very good. I think, I, I think it's an underrated aspect, but more than anything, you know, Jokic gets credited with so much of the vision and the passing that he makes and rightfully so. I mean, he's, he's an all timer at that regard, but Murray, I think does so many things to set up a lot of Jokic's great passes because he too reads the court so well and their chemistry with that, it's not always just the two-man game back and forth to each other, but even now with Aaron Gordon and Michael Porter, two guys again that once you start switching on the backside, they start to get size and weight advantages. Murray is so good at bending the defense to put them, take them out of position for an easy Michael Porter duck in, Aaron Gordon duck in or cut, and it's just working beautifully right now. Five or six times a game, Murray will have what should be credited as a, a, a cut assist or something like that, where his cut just he, he's fooling the defense, knowing exactly what he's doing to opening something up. I'm glad you brought that up because when people think of Jamal Murray, they think of contested jump shots. They think of yeah. a guy who has huge balls. They think of a guy who's comfortable in the spotlight. It, I, I don't think smart is the first mm. term that comes up. He right. is a really smart player. The yes. way he prods and reads the defense – the way he and Jokic know how to play off of each other and use these little one-foot windows of space in effective ways is really, really special. That's what I actually I, what I was really interested in most in asking you is like, you know, I am almost afraid to jinx it because nothing lasts forever in the NBA. Right. Nothing yeah. even seems to last for five years. But these two guys are so good together. Yeah. And Porter is incredible. Like the fact that they drafted him because of all the injury concerns he right. felt to them and is now hitting uh, his potential. This ha the NBA man would it be amazing for the league if in a non glamour non coastal market these three guys or four guys or two guys whatever you want to consider the guys can grow together and be together. I mean M Murray and Jokic could be Stockton and Malone. I mean, would it could love be, that. It, it could be fifteen. I mean it. Is are people should I not should I be fearful of saying that? And are people in Denver, you know, basketball has never been the number one or number two right. sport there really. Right? Are they starting to realize like this is a pretty awesome thing that could happen? Like this could be we could be contending for championships for ten years. I think it's starting to it's really starting to hit, and that bubble run had a lot to do with it. You know, it wasn't just nationally; even locally, I think people were skeptical of whether the Nuggets could could make a run that deep at this stage, or if they're missing pieces, or this or that. And so, I think there was a lot of enthusiasm following that. But I like that you said that because you're right; those two do fit together so well, and it's so rare to get two players drafted in an organization that kind of come through the ranks and develop a chemistry like that over time. And I mean, this is six years in the making. And you just don't see that too often anymore. And the, and the chemistry is so great, and it is. And they such and they held basketball. and to credit Tim Connolly, they held fast to Murray right. when Murray was not shooting well. When Murray was shooting thirty three percent from three, and people like me were like, "Well, where I, I thought this guy was supposed to be a shooter." When he was right. hesitant right. taking threes, when he was take t t dribbling out of threes to take floaters, they sniffed around trading for Eric Bledsoe. Wouldn't include Jamal Murray in that. Obviously, right. didn't do it. They had that deal lined up for Kevin Love the night Paul George got traded to Oklahoma City, right? They were right. going to be part of some four-team monstrosity. Jamal Murray wasn't going to be in that. Right, right. Jamal Murray was my wild card if a wild card yeah. team should go after Kyrie Irving. It's Denver using Jamal Murray. N nope, nope, nope. This guy's going to be a star. He's going to be a star. He's going to be a star. He's made for the playoffs. And they were 100% right. They didn't get Kevin Love. They didn't get Eric Bledsoe. They didn't get Kyrie Irving. They were 100% right to stick to their guns. And now they have a chance yeah. to grow this thing internally for a long time. And Porter, we really should talk about Porter because I, in my 10 things column about three weeks ago, I had a, a note that he was getting better on defense. That finally he was starting to make reads off the ball. Look, is he a plus defender? No. Right. Um, is he going to make mistakes? Yes. But he's a playmaker on defense. He's getting like chase down blocks, and you can see his size. There was a game recently where he was trailing a shooter over a pick or something, and you could tell that shooter caught the ball and he was open. But you could tell that shooter thought, "I know there's a six ten guy who right. can really jump, like somewhere lurking behind me." 
I'm not. I'm not shooting. Like his size has a real deterrent effect. You can see and, it. And you talked about he's bouncy. His athleticism is weird because there's parts of his. You know, he's very low in certain aspects athletically, but very, very talented athletically. And one of those is just how quickly he gets off of his feet for block shots, for rebounds, for tip ins, and things like that. And so, I. You're right that he still makes mistakes defensively. You're right that you're still not putting him on, you know, Kawhi Leonard or LeBron as your first option defensively or anything like that. But I do think that he's actually becoming a positive impact player in aggregate. You know, he might, he might, you might be right. He might be. And I think in a playoffs, it's where you really get tested because then teams start to say, okay, here's where he's weak. Let's try to put the, you know, where's the weak spots. And and, I, and I'm really curious to see how he does does there but over the four months of this season or whatever it's been he has gone from a guy that was making mistakes it felt like every other possession to a guy whose mistakes now are loud but but limited but they're balanced out by the big plays as you mentioned blocking shots as a trailer blocking shots as a weak side guy grabbing a lot of rebounds and helping clean up the glass and just the aggregate length now of denver murray six five barton six seven uh michael porter six ten aaron gordon six seven six eight but big and long so they're just the aggregate length. I think now is really causing problems for its for for offenses, and it, it's neat to see. And you can see opponents are making the decision: Do we put our four on Gordon, or do we put him on Porter? Right. And when Porter has a three on him, when he has a size advantage, I mean, he's 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 getting offensive rebounds, which is a really smart way for him to leverage his size and athleticism over those guys. And he just can shoot over them. Like he's an incredible shot. People who have not watched enough of the Nuggets, just watch the shots that Michael Porter takes and makes look easy. And they're not easy. There's dudes right at his in his waist, and he doesn't care. I put this on Twitter real quick. I put it on that he. My favorite mixtape from last year was just every shot Michael Porter made last year because you watch it and it looks like a mixtape of difficult shot making, but it's just he's so efficient at tough shots. Swish, swish, swish. Um, and I give him a lot of credit. Like, you can tell if you watch really carefully, you can tell. I don't want to say tension. You can tell he'd like more okay. of the offense. Okay. You can tell. You know, there are possessions where if he gets a rebound, right, he's right. taking the ball up the court. He's not just going to pass it to Nicola, who's calling for the ball, and he's going to take some time. So it's there. But he deserves a lot of credit. He has not forced anything. He is not sitting there clamoring to run 20 pick and rolls a game. He's not he's not ducking into the post with against right. things that aren't mismatches. He's not going ISO. He has fit in beautifully around Murray and Jokic and he can score 20 25 points a game that way. It, it's it's been a pretty seamless fit. I think you we you made the point earlier about Jokic and Murray and the connection they've made and it's been 6 years. It's only been 2 years with Michael Porter and one of the things I'm really curious to track over the next several years is just Aaron Gordon comes in, he's not taking tough shots. Michael Porter, I think early on to your point, really was not really understanding where his shots were, wanting more touches, wanting some of the plays they ran for him were plays designed to get him an ISO, not within the flow of an offense, but hey, here, let's all clear out for him so he gets one up here. And now I, I really do think the biggest growth for him has been he's found so many shots within the flow of the offense, and he is passing up, maybe begrudgingly so, but he is passing those shots up, and the offense is humming, and I think he scored – now, for over a month, 15 points or more in every game since March 2nd and on over 50% shooting on every single one of those games. So he's not having any off nights in large part because he's accepting what a good shot is. They basically have a big three. I mean, it might be too early to say that big three is sort Maybe. of this moniker that gets tossed yeah. around about legends, but he's their third core piece now. Right. It's not just – I think it's if he stays healthy – it's not just Jokic and Murray and everything else is fungible. I think he's a third core piece for them now. Yeah. So so to your point earlier, their defense is now up to 15th, which means it's probably been top 10 in the last month or something like that. Uh, and it's trending the right way. So here's my question to you. Aside from opponent, and we'll get to that because the West is overflowing right. with opponents who are unpleasant to play against. What worries you about the team? What are they missing? What's something you'd like to see more of? What's causing you anxiety? Honestly, it's nothing with that first unit. I think they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any first unit. Once you get to that bench unit, I, th I think you really worry about Denver runs low on shooting. They've got a lot of playmakers. They've got shooting in the front court. You know, They've been playing Jermichael Green and Paul Millsap as a sort of two power forwards, no center. And that lineup spaces the floor a little bit. But you're missing backcourt. P.J. Dozier, Monte Morris, Facundo Campazzo. You can't play all of them together. Monte Morris, Facundo Campazzo, bottom two percentile in, in height and weight uh, at the at the guard positions. 
not but top 100 percentile <laughs> in spunk it, it, and creativity at Amaris. It, it's true. Nobody in the NBA plays harder than Compazzo. I mean, he really he's so fun to watch because he is like he's uh, had 10 cups of coffee or something with how hard he plays on the defensive end. But it's just there's they're really small and, and really and not a lot of shooting in your backcourt and on the wing. And I think that's the one thing I know benches become less important. But as you talk about staggered lineups and as you talk about, you know, Denver lost to Portland two years ago in that game, uh, game three that went to four overtimes in large part because they couldn't play their bench any minutes. Every time they went to the bench, did Jokic play 60 something minutes in that game? 65. And I think he was a plus two <laughs> and they, they lost So 65 of 68. But, uh, so I do worry about the bench and specifically the shooting and length in the backcourt on the bench that I, their bench numbers have been pretty bad over the last four or five games. I wish they could play Jokic the whole game. Jokic probably could play the whole game, honestly, the way he plays. It's so effortless. Um, I said this on a podcast a couple episodes ago. Forgive me for repeating it, but every time he touches the ball, they get a good shot. I, that's a little hyperbolic because he'll commit a turnover or whatever. Like, But it's really the process is when they get him the ball, someone is getting a decent look almost every single time. And and that's in part because he is such a wonderful, efficient scorer himself. Um the bench thing, yeah, the shooting, that's all true. Every team's got bench problems. Right, I, I right. don't lose a lot of sleep over that. To me, the X factor for them is Barton yep. because he's now the nominal shooting guard. He's only an okay shooter, but he, his, his on previous versions of the team that lacked that kind of zip and athleticism, his just sort of north-south, I'm getting to the rim, slashing, felt like a missing ingredient. And it's not a missing ingredient anymore. They don't need that as desperately as they did before. What they do need is for him to knock down some shots and supply some supplementary scoring. He might be a natural fit to play some of those bench minutes, by the way, if, if, if they're not going to stagger Murray. And Jokic. I, there's something to that, maybe. He, to me, is like, like um, I think Reggie Miller was saying in one of their recent national games, the game against the Clippers. By the way, that was an impressive win. That yeah. was a That was a wire-to-wire we are just better than you yeah. win. Um, whether they are or not, we'll see. But that was a strong that game. Strong they were. Win. Yeah. Um, he was saying, Reggie was saying, well, Aaron Gordon is, you know, may, might be the fourth option in Denver. I kind of think he might be the fifth option. If I you ask so Will too, Barton, yeah. he's definitely the fifth option. <laughs> and to me, when Barton, teams are going to dare Barton to make shots in the playoffs. And, and I think he's their X factor. Does that make any sense to you? Oh, I think absolutely. I, I refer to it as when Will Barton is good, that four-man lineup is is great. When he's knocking down shots, when he's staying within the lines, he's the one guy that maybe gets a little bit – you know, he was playing the best basketball of his career last season. In, Jan, in the month of January, Michael Porter hadn't played to that point. Jamal Murray gets hurt. Gary Harris gets hurt. Paul Millsap gets hurt. Uh, Mason Plumlee gets hurt. Denver's depleted, and Will Barton has to step up and basically be the number two for an entire month. And he did it. And he did it at a very high level. He gets hurt shortly after that. And he hasn't been the same since. And I think a lot of that is if you look at his efficiency around the rim this season, it's completely tanked. Worst of his career by a large margin. But he adds things. I still think he brings things to the table that Denver needs. He's 6'7 as a, as a he's shooting bigger, guard. He's, long, he's longer than you think. He's really long. And he can handle the ball. He can shoot. He he can read the court well as well. He can cut. And just adding – an when you have five guys that – you can do that, you, you know, that can all do that. This is a little different from Gary Harris, who could handle a little bit, but he wasn't a guy you really felt comfortable, you know, stretching the court and letting him run pick and roll. Barton, you can do that. I just think Barton has lost a lot of athleticism and is still playing banged up from where he was even one season ago. And that's the big question for me. He's a lot more of a consistent player when he's finishing at the rim, and he just hasn't done that this year. It's a good, people forget that he wasn't he didn't play last year in the in the bubble. Right. That was a huge loss for them that they survived all the way, you know, to within a hair of having the Lakers 1-1 in the Western right. Conference Finals to within one one AD3, which I'm sure you remember quite vividly. Too um, well. Too well. So what's the I mean, this is in the West you could answer this many different yeah. ways, but is, is there a particular matchup that either you really among, among the best teams in the West? Right. That is worrisome to you, or or fr or one that you think is pretty good for the Nuggets. Is there a team you would, boy? I'd like to not play them if possible, or are you just like we're a really good team. All these other teams are really good. Let's just have at it. I honestly think it's that second one a little bit. Um, 
you know, people, I, I tell people this is the best Nuggets team I've seen. And, you know, I've been watching the Nuggets for 25, 30 years. And they really look great. They're coming together. And they people ask me, well, are they more likely to win the championship or lose in the first or second round? I say, oh, lose in the first or second round. That's just, it's the West. Somebody really good is going to lose in the first round. That being said, the Lakers are the one team that I wonder how they match up. When you just look at it defensively, Aaron Gordon, I think, can do a very good job on LeBron. I'm curious to see it. But I he's really impressed me defensively one-on-one. Does that mean Michael Porter guards Anthony Davis? That doesn't feel good. Um, feels problematic. Feels, feels like a problem. Um, and, and I think, you know, the Lakers don't score that well, especially when you get down into that half-court game and you take away the transition. And Denver, I think, can maybe outscore them and, and scramble and do all of these different things and shoot the ball really and win the math battle. But you still look at some of those individual matchups and think, you know, Jokic can't guard Anthony Davis. Uh, Michael Porter can't guard him. Aaron Gordon's got to occupy himself with LeBron. I'm not even sure he can guard LeBron, but maybe he could make it tough for him. So that that remains the matchup that I think is really tough for them. Yeah, I mean that's LeBron and AD. That's that's tough. But I look around. I don't think what they did with, to the Clippers was a fluke. Me neither. Um, I, 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 you know, Utah. That's a series that both teams seem to be okay with. I, I think. I think that's that's anybody's series. If Phoenix. you look at the numbers over the last two seasons, though, with Utah and Denver, Denver has won every single one except for the three they lost in the playoffs. And again, no Will Barton, no Gary Harris. And I think a large part of it is Gobert's great. He makes Jokic work, but Jokic knows how to take him. And I think there's a psychological thing when your guy who shuts everyone down all of a sudden becomes a bit of, not a liability, but weakened. I think I just think Denver has an edge there. They've, they've beaten them too many times over the last two years. Yeah, I I, I don't know who I'd pick. I, Utah's obviously hit a new level as a team right. and has figured some things out about it. Conley is, is now really back and incorporated. Um, but I don't think Denver's scared of them for sure. Uh, Phoenix, I would pick Denver over Phoenix without thinking all that hard about it. No disrespect right. for the Suns. No slander, as LeBron would say. No slander to Utah. <laughs> um, and, you know, Clippers, Lakers. I mean, I think Dallas and Portland are, are really good teams. Like Portland yeah. with Norm Powell, that's a great fit. Dallas with Luka is unpleasant to play against. I, I'm just saying... It's time to start talking about Denver not as a, is as a cute upstart like maybe they could upset the Clippers or a little bit like they're a championship contender full stop and this Gordon fit is real and yeah. they're they're just really really good and they're deep and they've done like and it's it's not as if their front office has been perfect no front office is perfect but they've done a hell of a job building that team and I think I think this Gordon the Gordon acquisition is is a hand in glove kind of fit, and it's just it's exciting for the league to have this possibility growing in Denver. It's great. It's great for Denver fans. I'm envious. I, I think it's really exciting, and I agree with you. There does appear to be a sort of a turning of the tide with with how people are looking at Denver. Players are looking at them. Analysts are looking at them because I do think this is the first time where it looks like they make sense. They they don't necessarily have weaknesses where before you could say yeah, but can they do this? Can they do that? They're a lot stronger and more complete now with Aaron Gordon and and with Michael Porter. He's a huge part of this too. That Michael Porter's rise really predates Aaron Gordon arriving. It's just been augmented since he's arrived. The litmus test for the national discourse will will be how the MVP discussion sounds this week because the MVP discussion, you know, Embiid's back and when does LeBron right. come back and is James Harden a candidate? Should James Harden be a candidate? It should start with the guy in Denver is favored to win MVP right now. No. And should be. That's the that's the, everything else is like it's interesting and it's fun to tell. Oh, Giannis is coming. Giannis is amazing. Jokic is the MVP right now, and I suspect he's probably going to end the season as the favorite for the MVP, which is just absolutely wild to think about <laughs> the forty first yeah. pick or whatever he was. Uh, Adam Morris, you can you can find him at DNVR. He's an absolute knockout Denver Nuggets analyst, formerly of Denver Stiffs right. com back in the day. Hey man, I, I hope to. See, I I would love to be in Denver for a playoff game at some point soon, man. I would love to see if we can go out and grab a beer after a game, at the DNVR bar, no less. We, there you we go. Have our own bar, so we'll have you over. Thanks, Adam. Thank you.